it's an unfortunate reality of life that all of us are going to be hurt. Sometimes deliberately, sometimes accidentally, but none of us escapes. Sometimes the hurt is especially painful. It's painful when we're hurt by someone that's close to us, someone we trusted, a spouse who betrays us, a parent who rejects us or abuses us or never loves us the way we long to be loved, a friend who stabs us in the back, a business partner who was a close friend that cheats us. When things like those kind of things happen, we don't want to forgive them. If we forgive them, it seems like we're letting them off the hook. It seems like they're getting away scot-free. But Jesus tells us if we're going to be his followers, we have to forgive. As a matter of fact, Jesus says our own forgiveness depends on our willingness to forgive people who have hurt us, even who have hurt us in the most terrible and in the deepest ways. In Matthew 6.15, Jesus says, But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. This morning we're continuing with our series, Eight Things We Wish Jesus Never Said, and we come to Jesus' command that we have to forgive others. Now many times when we've been hurt deeply, we don't want to do that. So this is something we wish Jesus had never said, but the simple fact is Christianity is all about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the heart of the gospel. It's the lifeblood of the Christian life. Our salvation depends on God's willingness to forgive all our sins. And the same God who forgives us says if we're going to be able to receive his forgiveness, we must be willing to forgive others, even those who have deeply, deeply hurt us. Now, the early followers of Jesus Christ understood this. Paul writes in Colossians 3.13, Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. J.C. Ryle was an Anglican clergyman, a minister who lived in the early 19th century. He wrote a very famous set of commentaries, which Parker, by the way, uh, liked very much. And in his commentary on Matthew, he writes, There are few duties so strongly commanded in the New Testament scriptures as this duty to forgive, and few whose neglect so clearly shuts a man out of the kingdom of God. Now, why does a lack of forgiveness shut us out of the kingdom of God? Well, because God's kingdom is a kingdom of forgiveness. That's what Jesus is telling us when he says that God won't forgive us if we don't forgive others. Jesus is telling us forgiveness is a two-way street. We can't receive what we're unwilling to give. If you build a dam in the river of forgiveness and shut off the flow of forgiveness to others, you also shut off the flow of forgiveness to your own life. Now, Jesus didn't just command forgiveness. He also practiced it. We see the most dramatic example of that when he's on the cross. When Jesus is dying on the cross, he prays for the very people who nail him to the cross, the people who stood around mocking him. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus refused to let the last few moments of his life be be dominated by hatred and anger and thoughts of revenge. By asking for God's forgiveness for the very people who were hurting him, Jesus not only did what he knew was the right thing, he also chose his final emotional state. He didn't let others control his emotions. Have you ever said, that person makes me so angry? Well, when you say that, you're admitting their actions are controlling your mental state. Don't let other people control you. You can't always choose what will happen to you in life, but you can always choose how you will respond. The Bible tells us free yourself from the negative emotions of anger and hatred and revenge by forgiving those who have hurt you and turn your offenders over to God. You see, that's what biblical forgiveness is. It's not saying that what they did doesn't matter. 
it doesn't, it's not, it, it's not saying it didn't hurt or it wasn't important. It's saying, I release my right to get even with you and turn you over to God, to let him deal with the situation in a way that's best for you and for me and for everyone else. Romans 12, 9 says, never avenge yourself. Leave that to God. For he has said he will repay those who deserve it. Forgiveness also always has to be unconditional. If you put a, a condition on it, it's not really forgiveness. I'll forgive you if you never do that again. I will forgive you if you're sorry for what you have done. When Jesus was stretching out his, uh, was stretched out on the cross dying and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Who had asked for forgiveness? No one. Who deserved forgiveness? No one. Who around the cross was sorry for what they had done? Well, at that point, no one. Jesus offered forgiveness because he knew that's what God wanted him to do. It was the right thing to do for Jesus' own emotional state and for the people who were crucifying. So Jesus took the initiative. Did you know forgiveness is always at your initiative? You get to choose. You get to choose. You get to decide, are you going to hang on to the hurt or are you going to let the hurt go and move on with your life? God says, make the decision that sets you free and has the potential to set the person who has hurt you free to be a better person. Jesus tells us to forgive the person who has hurt us, whether they ask for it or not, whether they deserve it or not, even whether they've changed or not. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he calls his followers to do as well. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray in the Lord's Prayer that we, I read this morning, he says, forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, as we also forgive our debtors, those who've sinned against us. And as I pointed out as I read the scripture, this is the only petition in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus makes any comment about or elaborates on after he finishes teaching the prayer. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, Jesus elaborates by saying, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, is Jesus saying that God's like some child that says, well, if you don't forgive them, then I won't forgive you? No. Jesus is trying to help us understand that just as you can't catch a ball with a closed hand, you can't receive forgiveness into a closed, hard heart. Forgiveness is not natural for us as fallen human beings. We have to have our hearts changed. We have to have our hearts softened. As Isaiah says, we have to let God take out the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. <clears throat> if you're really ever going to forgive anyone, it's only possible as God changes your heart through Jesus Christ. What softens our heart? What changes us? Well, receiving Jesus Christ, but that means receiving God's forgiveness for ourselves. People who find it hard to forgive often find it hard to accept the fact that God has completely forgiven them. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you come to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and you ask Him to forgive you, and you're sincere, the Bible says He will forgive you. And even if you fall down and do the same thing, uh, an hour later, if you come to God and you ask Him to forgive you, He will forgive you. Now, it's not that he wants to empower you to live a life of change, but God's forgiveness is complete. And when you begin to know, not just in your head, but deep in your heart, that God really has forgiven all your sins because Christ took them on himself on the cross. Now, if you've asked Christ into your life, you're in Christ. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see you with all your sins. He sees Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Paul says. When you begin to realize that God has put your sins as far away as the east is from the west and he's chosen to remember them no more. When you internalize that fact that Romans says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are so overwhelmed by the fact that God would forgive you when you don't deserve forgiveness that you begin to forgive others. Jesus died to make our forgiveness possible. 
Jesus lived a life of forgiveness. Jesus taught about forgiveness. Jesus offered eternal forgiveness to anyone and everyone who would receive it. Jesus even told stories about forgiveness. The parables of Jesus are filled with teachings about the importance of forgiveness. Probably Jesus' most famous parable about forgiveness is the one that we all love, the prodigal son found in Luke 15. I know all of you know this story. A wealthy man who represents God in the parable had two sons. The younger son asked for his inheritance early. That shows, you know, great disrespect for the father. It's saying, I, I, I wish you were just dead. I want you out of the way. I don't want to live on this farm. I don't want to live according to your rules. I just want to get away from here. But amazingly, the father gives the younger son his inheritance, just as God gives us a free will and allows us to go out and do what, what, what we determine that we're going to do. And you know what he did? He went to the far country, and we know from what the older brother says later, evidently reports had filtered back to the family that what he was doing, he was just partying all the time and spending the money on prostitutes. But then one day, the money runs out, and at about the same time, the country goes into a recession or depression where he is. All of his party friends are gone. There's no one to help him. The only job he can get is feeding pigs. And as he feeds the pigs, he longs to have the food that they're eating because he's so hungry. But the Bible says one day he came to his senses and he decided he was going to go home to his father's house where at least he knew he wouldn't starve to death because the servants in his father's house had it much better than he did. And so all the way home, he practices his speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Take me back as one of your hired hands. But the father sees his son coming down the road. He runs out to meet him. He has the best robe in the house brought to cover his son's rags. He puts the family signet ring on his finger to express his acceptance back into the family. And then the father throws a huge party to welcome his son home. But as you know, not everyone is so glad to see the younger son. When his older brother comes in from the field and hears all the music and asks what's going on, when he finds out it's his party for his worthless younger brother, he flies into a rage and he won't go in. And the father comes out and the father says, Son, everything that I have is yours. Come in and rejoice because your brother was dead and now he's alive. He's lost and he was found. But the brother, the older brother, says, All these many years I've worked for you, and you've never even had a small party for me and my friends, and now you're doing all of this for my worthless brother who has disgraced the family and wasted the family's money. This whole story is about the lavishness of God's grace that extends to each one of us, even though we don't deserve that grace at all. But the older brother, he represents unregenerate mankind who refuses to forgive, because without a changed heart, we ignore our own sins and absolutely refuse to forgive the sins of others. You see, Jesus tells us you're either in or out when it comes to forgiveness. We either have to participate in the grace of forgiveness by both giving and receiving it, or we won't experience forgiveness at all. Jesus makes that abundantly clear in Matthew 18 in his parable of the unmerciful servant. In this parable, Jesus tells about a nobleman who owes, owes the king a tremendous sum of money that he can never possibly repay. The day comes when the debt is due and he has to appear before the king. And he and his whole family could be imprisoned, sold into slavery. He begs the king for mercy and amazingly, the king forgives the whole debt. And the man leaves for home completely debt free. But on the way home, Jesus tells us that this man came across someone who owed him just a small sum, maybe a few hundred dollars. And that on seeing this man, he grabs him by the throat and he demands to be paid in full. Well, when the man can't do it, he has him thrown in prison. Now, when the king hears about this, he calls the nobleman back to see him and he says, You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that, that he owed. Then Jesus comments, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now if only Jesus hadn't added that last little phrase. 
It's hard enough to forgive those who have really hurt us, but Jesus makes it even more demanding by insisting it can't be superficial. It can't be half-hearted. It has to be done with deep, heartfelt sincerity. What that means is you can't just pr pr pretend to forgive. You have to really do it. I could go on and on, but it's very clear in the New Testament that Jesus commands us to forgive those who have hurt us, even of the deepest hurts. But God doesn't ask us to do this without giving us some very good reasons for being obedient to Christ's command. Why should I forgive those who've hurt me? Well, to summarize, there are at least three reasons. First of all, as I've already said, because God's forgiven me. Colossians 3.13 says, Never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You will never have to forgive anybody else more than God has already forgiven you. You say, well, I didn't do some of the terrible things, some of these other people, some of these things that were done to me. No, your sins, though, nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. How many times have you done the wrong thing? How many times have you said the wrong thing? How many times have you thought the wrong things? How many times have you said, in essence, to God, I'm going to do what I want to do. I know it's not what I'm supposed to do, but I don't care. This is what I'm going to do. And how many times has God forgiven you? The God who has forgiven us again and again calls us to forgive others. But I just can't forgive what that person did to me, Pastor. As I said earlier, when it's hard for us to forgive others, it's usually because we don't feel really forgiven ourselves. We know 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it just seems too good to be true, especially if it, we fall down in that same area again and again. But the fact is, the Bible proclaims if you've asked God to forgive you, he has. Don't be like the man in Jesus' parable who owed the king a huge sum of money, was forgiven all that he owed, and then turns around and won't forgive his fellow, fellow uh, uh, servant who only owes him a relatively small sum. God has forgiven everything wrong you've ever done, past, present, and future, because Christ took that sin upon himself on the cross. Celebrate that forgiveness by forgiving others who have hurt you. The second reason the Bible says I need to forgive those who've hurt me is because resentment just doesn't work. It's counterproductive. Job 5, 2 says to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. Why is that true? Well, first of all, because resentment's unreasonable. Ecclesiastes 6, 9 says it is foolish to harbor a grudge. Resentment causes us to do foolish things. Have you ever seen the episode of the Three Stooges in which Curly's so tired of Moe poking him in the eyes, hitting him over the head, and slapping him on the chest? He's gotten so resentful he decides he's going to strap dynamite to his chest, so the next time Moe hits him, well, Moe's really going to get what he deserves then. But what's going to happen to Curly? That's the wisdom of resentment. The second reason it's foolish to be resentful is because resentment is unhelpful. Job 18.4 says, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. You always hurt yourself more than anyone else when you have resentful anger in your life. Someone may have hurt you 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. They've gone on with your life. But you're still, you know, allowing to continue to hurt you because every time you think about it, you're angry. You're not hurting that person with your resentment. They've gone on with your life. You're only hurting yourself. Resentment can't change the past, and it won't correct whatever damage has been done. The most unhappy people I know are people who are filled with resentment. The third reason resentment is foolish is because resentment is unhealthy. Job 21, 23 through 25 says, Some men stay healthy till the day they die. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. Research has shown the most unhealthy emotions human beings can have is burning resentment, a burning bitterness, an anger. It's like a cancer. It has tremendous physical consequences. Man goes to his doctor, I need more pills for my colitis. The doctor responds, who are you colliding with this time? Dr. S.I. McMillan wrote a book that showed that the two greatest causes of physical health problems in people's lives are guilt and resentment. He wrote, it's not so much what you eat as it is what's eating you. Resentment not only has tremendous physical consequences on our health, it also has emotional consequences. 
Resentment can lead to depression, to stress, fatigue. Why? Because nothing drains you emotionally like bitterness. Thinking of that former boyfriend who dropped you, that spouse that divorced you, the boss that stabbed you in the back, the parent who never told you they loved you. If you're holding on to something like that, brooding over it, it will drain your body of energy. You're just prolonging the hurt. You're committing emotional suicide. The Bible says, let it go. Forgive them, not for their sakes, but for your own sake. For God's sake. The third reason I need to forgive those who've hurt me is because I'll need forgiveness in the future. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, When you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive you your sins too. Now, God's forgiveness is based on what Jesus did on the cross. The only condition to having God's forgiveness is recognizing your need and asking for it through Jesus Christ. Then what does the Lord's Prayer mean when it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? I think it means resentment blocks our ability to receive and to feel the forgiveness Christ died to give us. God grants us forgiveness if we ask for it through Jesus Christ, but if there's a wall of resentment in our lives, we block our ability to receive what God is trying to give us. We cannot receive what we're unwilling to give. As I said earlier, you can't catch a ball with a closed hand, and you can't receive forgiveness into a closed, hard, bitter heart. God wants a river of forgiveness to throw th flow through our lives to cleanse us emotionally. And as it flows through us to other people, it helps cleanse them and heal a hurting world. The Bible says don't build a dam in the river of forgiveness. A man came to John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, and he says, I can never forgive that man for what he did to me. Wesley responded, then I hope you never sin. We all need forgiveness. Don't burn the bridge you have to walk across. So it's vitally important that you forgive those who have hurt you. But how do you practically do that? Well, first, you've got to reveal the hurt. You've got to admit it. I have to consciously identify those people who have hurt me. You know, it's easy for us to deceive ourselves and hide the resentment we feel for the people who have hurt us. We tell ourselves, oh, it really wasn't that bad or it was a long time ago. Well, it must be bad because you're still feeling those feelings of hurt and anger and resentment. Make a list of those who have hurt you. Be specific about what they said or did that hurt you. Why? Isn't that just rehashing? No, it's focusing. It's gathering all the hurt in one bundle and labeling it so you can get it out of your life. You can't get better until you admit you've been hurt. Some people need to admit they've been hurt by their parents. It's a very common thing in, in counseling for someone to say, you know, I, I don't have any self-confidence. And you say, well, why do you think you don't have any self-confidence? And they say, well, it was because of my mother or my father, maybe both their parents. You know, they never, they never complimented me for anything. All they ever saw was the bad thing. They were always running me down. Maybe your parents said to you, you'll never amount to anything. Or why can't you be like your sister? Or why can't you be like your brother? And it, I just don't have any self-confidence today because of that. Well, you know, they, they don't want to admit, though, that they're angry at their parent about that. I mean, after all, you can't love someone and be angry at them at the same time, can you? Oh, yes, you can. You can rationalize and say, my parents did the best they could, so I can't be angry with them. But you know, your parents didn't have to always pull you down, always look at what you did wrong and never compliment you and always put you down and never lift you up. And until you admit, that hurt me. And deep down inside, I'm angry about that. You can't deal with it. You see, hurt, you can do three things with it. You can re re repress it. You can say, well, nothing ever happened. Well, if nothing ever happened, why is that hurt, that resentment, that anger, why is it there? Repression doesn't work. You can try to suppress it. Oh, it doesn't really hurt. It's no big deal. If it's no big deal, why are you still thinking about it? The only thing that works is to confess it. You've got to admit it. You say, but I just want to close the door on the past. Well, that's great, but there's no closure without disclosure. Make yourself a list. Make it specific. And then after you've made the list, what do you do with it? Well, you've got to release your offender. How do you do that? Well, you forgive them. You don't wait for them to ask for forgiveness. You do it whether they ask for it or not. You do it whether they deserve it or not. Remember on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But no one was asking for forgiveness. No one deserved it. 
Forgiveness lets you choose your emotional state. It lets you move from negative emotions to positive ones. Forgive the people who hurt you for your own sake. For God's sake, no matter what they've done, don't let people from your past continue to hurt you in the present and into the future through your own resentment and bitterness. As I said before, they've gone on with their life, but it's still hurting you. It's still eating you on the inside. And so the Bible says, let them go, forgive them, turn them over to God. But don't deceive yourself. Forgiveness is not a one-shot deal, especially for the things that have hurt us most, most deeply. Why? Well, because the feelings keep coming back. You can say, oh, I forgive my father for physically abusing me, or I forgive, you know, my spouse for having an affair and running off and leaving me. But the thing is, it's not done at one time. It takes us time as human beings. You have to be willing to forgive them every time the feelings come up again. Let me give you just a little different slant on Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Peter asked, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times. Jesus answered, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Jesus is saying forgiveness has to flow like a continue, continual river if it's going to wash the bitterness and anger out of our lives. Every time that old hurt comes to your mind, immediately forgive them again. You say, well, how do I know when I've released my offender completely? Well, when you can think about them and it doesn't hurt anymore. When you can pray for them, for God's blessing on their life. When you can begin to pity, pity them. Hurt people hurt other people. That's why it's so important you deal with your hurt. Because if, if you don't, it will cause you to hurt other people in the same way. Why do abused children so often become abusing adults? Because that's one of the things you almost always find in the history of an abuser, that in fact they were abused. Well, you see, you move toward what you focus on. And if, you're, if you've got that anger and resentment in there, and if you've not dealt with that, that's what you're focusing on. That's what you move toward. And so the only way to be free of those negative emotions that can destroy your life and the people around you is to forgive. The third thing I need to do to forgive those who have hurt me, I've got to replace my hurt with God's peace. You see, Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And so as you release the offender and as you forgive them and ask God to give you the strength and the power to forgive them, you pray for God's peace to fill that place where the anger was before. Now, I know some of you are thinking right now, but it's not fair. If I forgive them, they get away scot-free. No, they don't. Let God settle the score. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God is loving and he's merciful, but he's also just. And there's a judgment day someday. Let God even the score. Remember, forgiving someone doesn't mean you're saying it was no big deal. It didn't really matter. It's, it's not placing yourself in a position to be hurt again in the same way by the same person. It's simply turning the feelings of anger and bitterness and revenge over to God in exchange for God's peace. <clears throat> and then letting God deal with what, uh, you, you, with what will only make you miserable if you try to hang on to it and deal with it yourself. So what's the bottom line? We as Christians are to be people of forgiveness. People who accept God's forgiveness. People who forgive others. And people who ask others to forgive us when we hurt them. Now that's something I haven't had time to talk about today, but it's very important. If God's changing your life and he brings to your mind people that you've hurt with things that you've said, things that you've done, you need to ask them to forgive you. It can help set them free. It can point them to Jesus Christ as they see that, that you never would have said that unless God had changed your heart. The bottom line is, does Jesus ask us to do the impossible? And the answer is yes, if you try to do it in your own flesh with your own power. In Luke 17, 13 through, uh, Luke 17, verses 3 through 5, Jesus says to his disciples, So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Now, if we're to forgive other people their sins against us, God forgives us even if we fall down again and again. It's one thing for me to forgive you two or three times a day, but seven times every day? Jesus' statement to Peter is even more demanding, not just seven times, but he says 70 times seven. Once again, God wants a river of forgiveness to throw, flow through our lives to wash out the anger and the bitterness and all the resentment and the angry feelings. 
faced with Jesus' command for continuous forgiveness for others. Luke 17, 5 says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. You see, they understood from beginning to end, from eternity past to eternity future, forgiveness is supernatural. It's part of sharing in the life of God. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what he offers us the opportunity to do. He says, come and walk with me. Take the Father's hand. Learn to be like the Father. And the Father is, has a heart of forgiveness. And he calls us to be people who offer forgiveness and live forgiveness. The thing that makes Jesus' impossible teachings possible are his presence and the presence of his spirit in our lives. So as you begin to share in the life of God through Jesus Christ, God's love and forgiveness fills your life up and it overflows on everyone around you. Jesus' invitation is to jump into the river of God's forgiveness and it will set you free. It will make you an instrument in God's hand of setting others free too. It's ironic to me that we have so many different emphases that we talk about, and we talk about God's forgiveness of us, but we so seldom talk about our responsibility to, in the same way, forgive others. It's what will set us free. It's what says to others that our lives have been changed, and it's what has the potential to change the world. Would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, one of the most difficult things for us to get deep within our souls is our forgiveness that you give us. Because, Father, we don't forgive ourselves when we fall down, especially again and again. We just can't believe that you could possibly forgive us because we can't forgive ourselves. Father, I pray, first of all, that you would help each one of us to realize the depth of your forgiveness. And that the power to change comes as we walk in the Spirit. We will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But we have to, Father, give our lives to you. And we have to be walking in the Spirit. And then, Father, you enable change that we could never change. But, Father, then you call us to forgive. And I know, Father, I'm sure in this auditorium, even with this small group of people, Father, that there are those who have been hurt so very deeply whether it's by a parent, a spouse, a business partner, a friend, who've been betrayed, Father, who've been wounded so deeply. Father, I pray that you would speak to their hearts and that by your power that they would be able to forgive the person who has hurt them. Not for that person's sake, but for their sake, Father, in order that they might be free. We thank you, Father, for your forgiveness, and we pray that you would help us to plunge into your kingdom of forgiveness. As we accept your forgiveness, as we forgive others, Father, and as we ask for the forgiveness from others from those when we have failed. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.